Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salam ala ashram al-Mursaleen. I welcome you all to this, sadly, the last session of the day. But I know people are very, I mean, Sarah has got no one is felt sleepy because the lunch was very healthy, I think, was very healthy today. Normally, they say the dangerous time is after lunch in all these conferences because people start early morning. When it comes to lunch, they relax and then they start to sleep. So I think they were, I think we're doing well. Now, this session, uh, I think uh, to start quickly, because I'm quite keen to get these people to, to, to talk, they are the expert. Uh, Sudan, for those they know it, uh, they don't know Sudan, Sudan has been a country in, uh, if you like, in the news for the last 20 or 30 years, quite a lot. Politically, economically, sociocultural, and technologically, and there's many things about this country. But the important thing we're going to discuss today is Sudan has, has been the, the only country, actually, in the whole world which claimed, claimed officially uh, by lots of documentations from the government and the international, if you like, uh, landscape, is the country which holds the potential to feed the world. And I'm not exaggerating because these people here, they call it not only to feed Africa and the Middle East, but the whole world. This has been a claim, and I brought this from, this is an official document. It actually is, I have to get lots of flights to get it. You can see it here. It's from the University of Sussex. And I'm not here promoting my university, but the science technology policy, which have this document. The government of Sudan, they don't have this document. And I can assure you, they don't have it, but we have it. Uh, this document, sorry? Published by whom, this document? I am coming to that. Just hold, hold your breath. <laughs> now, the science technology policy is number one think tank in the country. So I'm promoting my school because it is, it is a, it's a leading science and technology policy in the country. And they have a big library. And I would like to mention here, in 2012 or 13, when his bro moved from one building to a new building, they have uh, given up, donated their library. Uh, and the dean at that time asked us all in the staff, in the whole school, give us, a, uh, because most of it is became online, and they said, ask us for nomination, where do we send it to? What would be the best thing to do with that library? And everyone proposed his or her suggestion what to do with the library. I proposed to take it to Sudan. And on Wednesday, I think, 3 o'clock, I got the confirmation from the dean saying, Alam, you can send it to Sudan. But you have to send it by Friday, so I only got Thursday. <laughs> But the good news is this library right now at the University of half of it was it's been divided between University of Khartoum and uh, Red Sea uh, University, uh, University in uh, Port Sudan. And gratefully was what's his name now? The, I mean, two people really I would like to acknowledge them here. Professor Ahmed Hassan Al Fahal. He was, uh, I think, the, the pro vice chancellor at the University of Khartoum for uh, responsible for the library. He helped to facilitate to get that half part to the University of Khartoum. It's available there. Anyone can go. And this is the best library in innovation studies. It's available in Khartoum now. But the second part was at Red Sea uh, State. At that time, the governor was uh, Dr. Ela, who is currently the governor, the governor of the central state. He massively helped to have it, uh, half of it in Bor Sudan. So the science and technology policy have been keeping lots of documents, and this is one of them. Now, what is, this, what is the claim? Long time ago, 1970s, lots of reports uh, claim that Sudan has the potential, or had and has still, to feed the world. And in, two, in 1977, Sudan actually, as a government, declared formally in the World Food Forum that Sudan has the potential to do that. Like imagine now, you declare in a, in a major international conference we have the potential to feed the whole world. Then this document, which I'm referring to, is, is a series by the uh, called Studies on Developing Nations, number 794, and is by the Institute of World Economics of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences in Budapest. And the Hungarian Academy is very respected one in economics. And this was published in 1977. So we're talking about 40 years. This document was published nine, 40 years ago, still exists, and you can see it has been typeset by the machine. And that document, the title of it, will Sudan be an agricultural power? Because when Sudan raised the claim that Sudan can feed the world, those people studied that economic. This is an economic analysis. It's a serious work done by a completely independent body, which is the Hungarian Institute of Economics Analysis. 
And the question they ask, هل هل ممكن أن يكون السودان قوة قوة زراعية? And what they did, they said, let's analyze the claims that Sudan can actually feed the world. Because imagine you are an economist and suddenly you hear about a country which could solve the food problem in the whole world. So what you hear in the news, whether you are Sudanese or non-Sudanese, is a true fact, or a, is a fact, is a true story about Sudan. And for those who they studied agriculture or natural resources, it's, it's simply to justify it. Because we got the river Nile which crossed the country, so we don't have a problem with, with water. And the soil of Sudan is very fertile. And most of the reports from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations confirm that. Not only Sudan, but many countries like Sudan, they got lots of thousands of acres is still not being touched. Plus, the Sudanese soil is fertile. It's not a, a soil like Saudi Arabia or UAE or the Gulf, which has some salination and so on. They need, it need what we call it, soil desalination and so on. No, it's a soil which you can grow straight on it. That's number two. So if you have the land massively and you have the water, there is no reason you cannot grow massively. So that's a fact. And then people start to study this. I will tell you what they have said 40 years ago later. But what we try to do, if we look now to the situation of Sudan 40 years from there now, a couple of things. Some claims by political commentators and in the news and by international bodies there's so many millions, not thousands, in Sudan are actually struggling with finding food. So a country which has the potential to feed Africa, Middle East, and in this report, the whole world. Because 40% was claimed to be come from here. So it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult to understand. That's 40 years ago. So why are we still having people in Sudan struggling to find food? Of course, it might not be because we are not producing enough or conflict and so on. But as you may also follow the news, there are lots of examples being cited in the media, by particularly in the Middle East, like a Rajhe project, which is a Saudi Arabian uh, investment in agriculture in Sudan. And most, most important example is the United Arab Emirates example about how the projects implemented in Sudan considered or reached that point to be considered as food security for United Arab Emirates. And the word food security, countries cannot say it like this unless they know this will be a food security. And by the way, many people, they don't realize that. The critical factors in the, the major global challenges, one of them is food. And you can see it here in Tesco, you go to Saudi Arabia, the most expensive thing is food. If you can produce food, you have most of the problem solved. Food, you can produce it. And if you look to Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, all these countries, they cannot produce food because the land is not fertile. In, the, in Europe, most Europe, we cannot produce many of the products because of the climate and so on. So the idea is why Sudan is not even feeding its own people, according to lots of reports. But what we're going to do here, we have four, five or six experts, plus we have one online, which is, I think the, uh, I'm going to introduce them one by one, but we, we're going to ask them to contribute to this debate in different angles. We have people on the Facebook, people from all over the world following us. If you have any question, please uh, try to write it as we speak, so we can actually engage in this debate. Sorry? Using the hashtag together the world is better. Yes, using the, hash, the hashtag to, to, together the world is better. And I tell you why we selected this topic, because if Sudan can feed Africa and the Middle East, or the Arab countries as we suggested here, I think that's not only the world is better, but actually the whole problem is solved. Imagine you have countries are struggling to get food now. One part of the problem between now Qatar and Saudi Arabia, it, it involves importation of food from Iran and so on. You all follow that, because Iran can produce and so on. And uh, so this is uh, what we're going to do here. I have the pleasure really having these distinguished people. Uh, I am going to start one by one. I will start by Professor Hamad Bagadi. Professor Hamad Bagadi is a distinguished professor. He got his PhD from Edinburgh University. Uh, he, until he left Sudan, he was the dean of the faculty of the Trinity Science. And at that time, to be a dean, you really have to be a dean. <laughs> it's serious. <laughs> you, uh, it's at that time, really, you have to be a distinguished professor, distinguished experience. And plus, he was well respected among his peers within the veterinary medicine and so on. And he's going to talk to us about animal health and production in the Sudan. So the production, because animal or the livestock, like we're going to discuss, is part of that food security one. So I will ask him to start. But uh, 
Most importantly, Professor Bagadi also has been a senior and a lead consultant for IFAD. IFAD is the International Fund for Agricultural Development in Italy, which is a fund which look after all this funding relating to agriculture. So he has been in the far front is in advising uh, major international organizations, plus in the academia, and we have the pleasure of having him. Um, uh, he's retired now, but he's uh, healthy, he's still young. <laughs> so I'm sure he's going to give us uh, a, a good perspective to start with. So can you tell us about the animal health and production? Because that's part of the, of the story. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, really, it is an honor for me to participate in this panel, and it is a pleasure to be among eminent specialists to discuss matter important to our country. Uh, yes, Sudan is one known to be a rich agricultural land, both plants and animals. And the FAO has long warned about the incoming international shortage of food. And the Sudan has been named as one of the areas which can contribute on this shortage. However, for Sudan to keep up to be food basket for Africa, food basket for the uh, uh, Arab world, there are certain requirements to improve it is uh, animal production, both agriculture and plants. Uh, I am going to, to this end, I am going to concentrate on the animal side because this is my specialty. I leave the agriculture for other people to discuss. Uh, there are certain requirements and prerequisites for the Sudan if you want to keep up to be a food basket, have to follow certain criteria or requirements to fulfill this goal. Uh, I'm going to skip the number of animals because it's not important for you. It is 107 million sheep, goats, and cattle. This is not important. I'm going directly to what are the requirements for the Sudan to keep us as, uh, to keep as a food basket for... So, them. Professor, these are the factors if the government uh, considers them seriously, yes. Yes. we could we could, uh, we could justify yeah. this claim. Exactly. Okay, okay. fine. The first <coughs> requirement is the land ownership in the Sudan. As, as you know, there is no law up to now to regulate uh, agriculture and pasture in the Sudan. Yeah. And this will lead to conflict always, and therefore is a good example. Thanks. The effect of this will lead to animal diseases, disruption, lead to migration of animals to different places, and loss of grassland, and so on. So the first thing is to get this land ownership law so that you can keep your animals in those areas. Uh, the second requirement is the unplanned expansion of agricultural schemes against pasture for animals. I am not against the agricultural expansion, but has to be balanced between animal production but and... Professor, can I interrupt you? Uh, can I ask those who are watching us from Sudan, from or not from Sudan, anyone, if you know anyone in the Ministry of Agriculture or anyone or that, anyone in dealing with agriculture and animal production in Sudan, please send them the link, let them watch, and they can actually, we can give them a chance to contribute. So please, if you're watching us from anywhere in the world, you know anyone in the Ministry of Agriculture or if you're in Sudan, please let them catch up with this uh, workshop and then we give them the chance to, f to comment. Uh, thank you. Uh, I am not against agricultural expansion. It has to be balanced between pasture and, uh, and uh, plant production. If you take example of the Rahad project scheme, this is half a million Fadan, used to be pasture land for animals and it was intended to include the animals in this scheme that they have never implemented this at all. Other schemes like Agash, Toker, Abu Habil, so many of them, but the animals are excluded from these projects. Uh, the third requirement, which is very important, control of animal diseases. You cannot export anything unless you have healthy animals, so this requires proper laboratories for diagnosis, vaccine production, and research, very important. Uh, you need mobile clinics because the veterinary profession is not an office profession, it's a mobile profession. You have to go to the animals, camels and sheep far in the desert 
to treat them, so we need mobile clinics. Then you have to cooperate with international organizations because like the FAO in Rome and OIE in France and the IFAD, these bodies help you in research, advice, and if you have any problem, they will solve your problem. So we have to keep very close relationship with these uh, international organizations. Also, there are some regional organizations like IBAR, this is in Africa, Inter-African Bureau of Animal Resources, and uh, Near East Animal Research Institute. These are all regional laboratories to cooperate so that you can get your uh, help anytime. Another thing is to cooperate with international reference laboratories. If you have any problem, viral infection, for example, you don't know how to diagnose it, there are international reference laboratories in UK, Bellbright, in the biggest laboratory for diagnosis of viruses. If you have Rift Valley fever, the best laboratory is South Africa. And this reminds me of 2007, 2008, outbreak of Rift Valley fever in Sudan. Unfortunately, it wasn't controlled properly. The contradicting reports between medicals and vets and the people just, you know, confused what to do. They did not follow properly. They did not send the samples to South Africa directly and uh, very late indeed. Anyway, they finished, uh, they controlled at the end. The other, uh, the other requirements, number four, is improvement of productivity. You have your local breeds like uh, in cattle, for example, Kinana and Botana, these are the best breeds. You can crossbreed them with Western Bagara and other poor uh, types, and this will increase your meat and milk. Also, you can introduce foreign breeds like Frisian and others in goods also from outside, but these require special environment, special feeding, and this will increase your meat. And uh, then proper feeding of your animals definitely needs fodder in the Sudan. The gap of fodder, the shortage of fodder in the Sudan is 200 million tons per year. And this is an area which will encourage investment on fodder production in the Sudan. Very important because you have the land and the water and there is shortage in the Sudan. Uh, proper feeding always improves the fertility of animals. Fertility in sheep and camels is about 35%. But if you really well, feed, uh, well better fed, fed, you will get a shorter period. And I witnessed an example in Tunis when I worked with the IFAD. Tunis have got 100,000 camels only, compared to Sudan, which have got 5 million camels. These people fed their camels in the byproducts of olives and they managed to reduce the breeding period. They managed to fatten calves, uh, camel calves. They send the meat after nine months, they send the meat to, to, to France, and the price is 10 times the price of uh, beef because it is low in cholesterol and low in fat. They also exported uh, pasteurized milk. So this is Tunis, with 100,000 camel only. So if we improve our feeding, better feeding of animals, you can increase, increase the fertility. Uh, another requirement, if the Sudan decide to export live animals, uh, sorry, meat instead of live animals, is we need what we call disease-free zone. And the disease-free zone was suggested in the 70s. It is an area demarcated by natural barriers. It was suggested that in the Kassala province and Port Sudan province. You have the Red Sea Hills to the right, Adbar River to the left, down to Kassala and Qadar. This is triangle. All the animals entering this triangle are supposed to be fully vaccinated, free of disease, good fodder, and then you can construct slaughterhouses in that triangle and you can export uh, the meat directly outside. But it has not been implemented up to now. From the 70s? From the 70s. 70s. Uh, 
the other requirements because most of the animals are in the western side of Sudan. Uh, there is a suggestion of 1991 to establish what you call pastoral farming. Mazara Rawiya Bal And this is supposed to be an closed area, enough pastures, enough uh, water, uh, strong veterinary service. The animals can be really in good health so they can export them uh, outside. Uh, this has never been done, of course, because it is unstable. Western Sudan has never been stable at all. And the last requirement, Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to take it a long time. No, no, you're saying very useful stuff. Carry on. <laughs> the last requirement is the expert who can really implement these requirements. And this will lead me to veteran education in Sudan. Sudan had got one college, veterinary college, established in 1939, and the graduates until the 80s, from 1 to 40 plus annually, are all, all of them well trained, all of them had postgraduate facilities, all of them had research outside, and they could really do a better job in controlling animal disease and research. What is happening now, the faculty takes 200 students. Not only that, they open another five veterinary schools. Are we really need such an uh, horizontal expansion of uh, veterinary education? No, definitely. Because I managed to go throughout the Sudan, I saw the graduates of those faculties, very low standard, no training, no postgraduate. So we need really to look into veterinary education to get expert to do the proper job. Last but not least, we had a school for technicians and paravets in the past. These are very important because they can contribute in the vaccination, in the research, whatever it is. So we need to have a school for uh, uh, technicians and paravets to help the, in the control of animal diseases. Mr. Chairman, these are four points and I hope the Sudan, if they fulfill this, will be not only basket for Arab world, maybe for Africa, maybe Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Professor Bagato. Now, this is very, very useful starting. It's a prescription, very strong one. Very, very useful. Uh, coming from someone I think I consider it an authority. Uh, last week, uh, there was someone who was supposed to be in this panel, but the visa was, was very late to him, which is Professor Hassan al Dinar, he's a professor of agriculture in King Faisal University. He's the head of the postgraduate studies. He used to work at the Agricultural Research Corporation in Sudan, one of the distinguished research center uh, in Africa. And I want to tell you information. That center is used to be the, the largest research institution in the entire Africa. 365 professors from all Newcastle. He sees himself from California, all top universities. He said uh, he's been approached by the Ministry of Agriculture to asking us to help to, start to run a workshop about the same, because he's not here now, about food security and sustainable agriculture in Sudan. And I hope he's listening to us. Professor Ali Dinar, if you're listening to us, please, we would like you to contribute. Now, I will go to, but, um, number one, land, ship, uh, land ownership, there is a lack of law. We will, we will get, because we have an expert in international law, we can ask Nag if he can help later. And land expansion, this is to do with policy. Now, I want just to ask you one, two things about the con control of animal diseases. This has been a big problem. Yes. And also the lack of co collaboration and coordination with international bodies like IFAD and so on and so on. Yes. From your knowledge, I don't want to ask you too much, but do you know why we are not collaborating, we are not engaging with international bodies like IFAD and so on? Uh, well, there's some cooperation between the OIE and the FAO and but uh, just to give you an example of Rift Valley fever. Okay. When they had an outbreak, because Rift Valley fever is dangerous for human health first. Yes. And then we sabotage your export of sheep. They did not handle that uh, outbreak properly. You should send directly to South Africa uh, the samples and tell people properly what to do. Even the FAO recommended after the control of Rift Valley fever you have to continue surveying your, the sheep around the area for two years. And they introduced a system called Impress, 
emergency prevention and surveillance system, but it's not also implemented in the Sudan. And do you know why? Why the government is not coll collaborating in something which will help them to export and well, get well, foreign they currency? They really have relation with OIE, and if you know, I know this, uh, but uh, sometimes you, they need uh, technical advice, they need uh, funding for research. Okay. It's not, uh, not uh, available. One thing to mention here, because the idea, yes? Can I ask a question? Collaboration with public health. Public, okay. with the public health. I noticed you mentioned there were different views around the control of the yeah. 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 The health yeah. said it's well controlled, yeah. and the veterinary said yeah. it is not. Yeah. So, so, what is happening in the interface? Do you have, yes, about collaboration with the public health. Because animal yeah. health and the area, it is where you want your expertise, I believe. One of the most subjects we teach our students in medical and veterinary school is zoonosis. And such a disease like uh, Rift Valley Fever, a zoonotic disease, supposed to be a cooperation between medical and vets, because both of them are required to control this disease. So uh, I think now, I suggested so many faculties when I went around the Sudan, medicals and vets, to teach the subject of zoonosis to the final year students so that they can cooperate between medical and vet. If any, as you know, the zoonotic disease are now about 150 number. So th they have to be cooperated together to get control of this disease. Okay. But I think Professor Bagadi, yes. about that problem, the people, they know how, yeah, yes, the they lack the know-how, and the problem is that if they declare that Sudan have this disease, that they think they can sabotage the export of animals and so, and no person can help. Some of the people, they said, no, we had not to announce it, we had not to say that, because this is dangerous. But this is a policy, this is politics, and it is not the right way. And that's the problem in Sudan. Okay. Sometimes the people give the negative advice, even though they know that is not correct and that is destroying the country. Can I just no, 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 we will come. No, 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 we will just need to move. I will come. I will give everyone a chance. Now, there is one here boy in the mission, Professor Bagadi, is the productivity improvement, because this is the whole thing about technology transfer. He said that this uh, local and foreign breeds to try to improve productivity, he said that hasn't been done from the 70s. So from the time the claim was made, Nothing being done. Seventies is a long time. If, if you can just go back. So disease free zone. Yes, oh. and the disease free zone. The conflict in Darfur is affecting. So these two things, I think, they are chronic problem. Like you can see here in this country, when the, any of the parties complain about the, about NHS, then they will say to them, "This is not our fault. This is being we inherited a blank like housing in the UK. If you co if if the Labour complain about the shortage of housing these days, the, the Conservative will say, "This is not our problem. It's been an ongoing problem." So in this. The policy maker, this is an ongoing problem for the 70s. Now, just another thing I want to ask you also. Because you remember when uh, the, the higher education revolution, so were the Ta'lim al-Ali, when it came with the current government 30 years ago, the claim was we have very little graduates. That was, I remember, when it's been declared as a revolution, the higher education revolution, so were the Ta'lim al-Ali. The claim was we have graduates we have uh, students who finish the high secondary school with a result like 75%. They don't get a place in, they actually have no place in university. And therefore, the, the, the policy was to open up more universities so that those students can actually get to university. At that time, I remember Sudan had like 35,000 agricultural graduates on the street, have no jobs. So therefore, you did not expect when you expand university places, you're going to have more agricultural students because you already have 35,000 on the street, actually graduate of agriculture doing other works. When this country, the UK, Tony Blair realized we have a shortage of British doctors in our hospitals, Tony Blair, I remember, was the university, he said he wanted to, what is the solution? He said in five years' time, we need to have enough number of doctors. And universities advise him, so government get a, a good advice, not like in Sudan, they said to him, in order to have five, uh, 1,500 doctors by this year, whatever, 2009, whatever, you should start expanding the number of medical schools. And at that time, I remember any university which expand the number of students doing medical school. They did not expand anything, but they expanded the medical school. In this country, 
Medical school is statistic. You can get a sponsorship but if you are a British or you are a citizen here. But business school, we don't get any support because they consider business school not like the necessity of medical and so on. So my question to you, so you totally agree, or you, 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 why do you think the government is expanding the, the number of veterinary students? Why we don't need them in the first place? There's so much of them, we already have them. So what do you think, why, we, why the government is doing that? And I'm going to ask Nahid as well, because she is in the university now. Well, I have no answer for this, but... Uh, what from I your knowledge. From knowledge, I think they sh we should have uh, an, a number of... Number should not increase more than two faculties or three. So they are just doing it as a political yes expansion. Okay. Yes. Now, Nahid Professor, Nahid is a professor at the University right now. We will come to your part, but for this particular point, you are at the University and in the Faculty of Animal Production. Why the University is keep expanding for in, in in veterinary graduates? While we, I would say we don't need them, but we we have enough of them outside. I'm what sorry. <laughs> It's not the policy of the university, it's a policy of the government, no. by the way, okay. and it's a private section. I'm sorry to say, but it's money-wise for them. It's, uh, so it's just a hazard policy? Yeah. Okay. For me, this is my uh, okay. opinion. Okay, and uh, that's fine. The, the last thing I want to ask, when they close this school of, te uh, of technician, uh, why did they close it from as far as you know? I have no idea why they did this, but, uh, you know, maybe it's not attractive for the technician to continue on that, uh, in that field. But I think it's very important because all the vaccination and research and anything in the field is done by technical staff. And one, qu and one question, Professor, are you, you have been the dean, and I know it's a sensitive question, but with, I, I, because we want to get the best out of this. And you have been the dean of the school of, of the trade residents and been a uh, distinguished professor at the university. Yeah. To what extent you are happy or to what extent you are very unhappy with the quality of our current university teaching staff. Particularly Khartoum. I'm definitely unhappy. How much you are during, happy? During One during out of ten. During my <laughs> two out of ten. <laughs> so you're happy two out of ten or unhappy? Unhappy. So that's not much unhappy. <laughs> sorry, sorry, just opposite. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a dean, unfortunately, uh, arbitration of the curriculum was introduced. I am the man who introduced Arabic unwillingly in the faculty. We found it very difficult to teach in Arabic. And the students, when they graduate, they have no knowledge of anything. They have no way of doing postgraduate at all. Professor, sorry to, I, I mean, I'm keeping it up for the sake of argument. You said unwillingly. You mean at that time when you were, yeah, they, you, they asked you if it be Of course, the policy. You were not being consulted at the dean? No, just expansion of, you know, revolution of any. Uh, so no one consulted you at the dean at no, that time? No, 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 at all. Okay. <laughs> okay. But now, sorry, uh, luckily the, the, the faculty of vet in, uh, in University of Khartoum is shifting this year to teaching in English, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Now, thank you very much, Professor Bagali. Very good start. I'll come to you now. I'm going to move to uh, Dr. Uh, Nahid. Before I do that, I just want to bring to your attention one thing, because uh, we, this whole project of diaspora is about actually highlighting the people who we don't, we don't know them. In, in one of the leading animal research centers in this country, which is the one near Bristol, just from Bristol, they know it's called the Animal Research Institute, I think, the animal. Uh, uh, yeah, this is the leading research center for, in this country for uh, animal research. And at some point, all the, what is it, the biological uh, defense research, you know, about when that issue is when that down, and so on. After that, people start to be very careful about biological weapons and so on. Part of the research is being done there. So the leading, if you go there, you have to get permission to go through security and so on. One of the leading research centers in the world, but definitely the best, the highest in this country. One of our graduates from one of Professor Bagadi's students, Dr. Abu Bakr Omidian, I hope he's watching us, he's in Nottingham. He's a graduate of, he did his PhD there, and he's one of the leading distinguished scientists from that institute, and he's currently at Nottingham University. So it's worth mentioning that even in this leading institution in this country, very sensitive institute, we have a leading scientist there called Dr. Abu Bakr, one of your graduates, I guess.